Let's pray together. Father, our hearts are full of gladness and thanksgiving, and at the same time full of indignation and sorrow. And Lord, we thank you for this word that you have given to us. We thank you for these promises and these hopes. We thank you that we can look forward to a better day, a better future, when the true king reigns, when the instruments of violence will be needed no more and never again be used against human flesh. And so, Lord, as we look into Psalms 20 and 21, our hearts cry out to you, Come, Lord Jesus. Come and come and redeem this world. And in the meantime, Lord, we ask that by your Spirit you would come and cause us to hope fully in you and enable us to live for you. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If you haven't seen the Planned Parenthood videos, you've no doubt heard about them. And if it wasn't clear before, it ought to be clear now that the society in which we live is a wicked society. The society in which we live is a society in which uh, the government is extracting money from us that it's using to fund organizations like Planned Parenthood, which chop unborn babies up, and then sell the body parts. And it's not only that. It's a society in which a judge, someone who's supposed to stand for justice, issues a restraining order to make it so that people can't know this is happening. So there's this organization that has videotaped what Planned Parenthood is doing. They've exposed them, and they've got something like five more videos to release And a judge in this United States has issued an order that they cannot release those videos. It's a great thing to have the Bible. And so I would invite you to look with me at Psalms 20 and 21. And what we have here are Davidic prayers for the king. And these prayers are particularly appropriate because the outrage that we're witnessing, the 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 flagrant violations of God's kindness and mercy and, and law, they are answered by what we see in these psalms. So what we're going to see in to- Psalm 20, in the first five verses, is a list of blessings. And, and these are wonderful statements. And, and I'm sorry if you've, if you've heard the psalmist saying these things to you personally, um, Last night, we were reading these, these verses in our family, and I said to my kids before I read this passage, I said, who is the you? So look, for instance, at Psalm 20, verse 1, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Who's the you that David is addressing? And um, one of my children said, the reader, the person reading the psalm. I don't think so. Well, then, then it's, it's the nation of Israel. No, I don't think it's the nation of Israel. And the reason I don't think that is because this is a singular you. In other words, they don't, in, we say in English, y'all. In Hebrew, they have a, a word for the, the, the group that would be me addressing you all, right? This is not y'all. This is you singular. One person is being addressed here. And we get a hint as to who that person is after these first five verses give us uh, what David wants to be done for this individual, when he says in verse 6, and and essentially what he's saying in verse 6 is, I know that the Lord is going to fulfill the prayers, the prayer wishes that I've just made. He says, I know that the Lord saves his anointed. And then down in verse 9, he says, O Lord, save the king. So the king, the anointed one, is the person, the individual you that's being addressed here. Now, how does this work? David's the king, isn't he? Right. David is the king. But we know from 2 Samuel chapter 7 that David was promised that the Lord was going to enthrone one of his descendants. And we know from Acts chapter 2 
that David was a prophet and he looked forward to the Lord raising up that descendant. And so I submit to you that what we have here in Psalm 20 verses 1 through 5 is David blessing the promised descendant that would come from his line. Which is to say, what we have in Psalm 20 verses 1 through 5 is David blessing King Jesus, the King Messiah who would come from his line. So in verses 1 through 5, David is going to um, make these statements that are presented in the form of blessings. And really, they're almost like prayers. Because this is what David wants God to do for his descendant. And then in verses 6 through 8, David is going to confidently assert, we just looked at verse 6, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. In other words, it's like he offers the blessings and then he comes back and he says, It's going to happen. God is going to do it in verses 6 through 8. And then in verse 9, uh, there's a final sort of summary statement, and and we'll look at that in just a moment. Um, As we come to Psalm 20, uh, I want to back out just briefly and think with you about where this psalm sits in the whole book of Psalms. And so we've been talking about how there's this unit in Psalms 15 through 24, If you want to glance at at Psalm 15, you see that question in in verse 1, who will sojourn in your tent? And then the answer is given. It's the righteous king that's going to sojourn in God's tent. And then if you look over at Psalm 24, you get the same question in verse 3, who will ascend the hill of the Lord and who will stand in his holy place? And then again, it's the same answer given. The righteous king is going to stand in the holy place. And once again, I I would suggest that David is thinking about that future descendant who is going to embody righteousness in a way that nobody else ever has or ever could. So I think David's talking about Jesus. And then between Psalms 15 and 24, you've got Psalm 16 where there's this marvelous statement of God's comfort. You know, he, he says, for instance, in verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. And the whole psalm is like that. And that matches Psalm 23. So these psalms are matching one another. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and so forth. And then Psalm 17, where David is confident that God is going to raise him from the dead. Look at Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness when I awake, when I awake from the sleep of death. And that's matched by Psalm 22, which is um, this, this prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it's, it's a need for resurrection, isn't it? And then, um, but in, inside those rings, you have Psalm 18, where David celebrates the way that God has delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And that is matched, Psalm 18, by Psalms 20 and 21, which we'll look at today, where David, on the basis of what God has promised to do in the Scripture... On the basis of what God has done in his own life, as he recounted in Psalm 18, David is now praying, God, do this for this descendant from my line that you have said is going to reign forever. And then in the middle of the whole thing is the psalm that we looked at um, last time we were together in the book of Psalms, Psalm 19, which extols the glory of God in creation and the glory of God in the scriptures. And this is not just just meaningless information that I'm giving you here. This is relevant because it's on the basis of God's glory in Psalm 19 that David is making the requests in Psalms 20 and 21. And it's on the basis of what God did in his own life that he recounted in Psalm 18 that David is confident that God is going to do this in the life of his descendant in Psalm 20 and 21. So David's confidence, hear me here, David's confidence is based on Scripture and on his own experience. David's confidence is based on Scripture and his own experience. And God means for you to get your confidence from the same place. God means for you to study the word so that you know what kind of things God says he's going to do. Then for you to experience God's faithfulness in your life. And then for you to approach life confidently. So let's look together at Psalm 20. Look more carefully here. And in verses 1 through 5, we have 10 blessings. 
Ten prayers, if you will, that David is, is offering up in the form of a, a, a wish, blessing, prayer statement for this descendant of his. So he says, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Well, what kind of day of trouble might David envision? Well, again, there, there's, there's a match here between Psalms 20 and 21 and Psalm 18. And, and back in Psalm 18, David had said in verse 6, In my distress I called upon the Lord to my God. I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice. And then he recounts the way that the Lord went into action on his behalf. I think that David probably anticipates his descendant having the same kind of distress that he faced in his own life. Opposition from wicked Israelites and then opposition from from other nations who, who reject the Lord. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. And then he continues there in verse 1, May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. And what would this mean for the name of the God of Jacob to protect the descendant of David? I think that probably what David has in mind here is that the name of the God of Jacob protects us because we know the God of Jacob. Why would David refer to him as the God of Jacob? Probably to make us think about God's faithfulness to Jacob in the scriptures. Probably to make us think about how God has been faithful all through the Old Testament to his people. And then out of that faithfulness, God gets a name. He gets a reputation for being this kind of God. He gets a reputation for being one who helps those who cannot help themselves. A reputation for defending the weak and the powerless, a reputation for caring for the, the, the stranger and the alien. This is the kind of God that, that is the God of the Bible. He gets a name for being that kind of God. And then people who find themselves in that kind of situation, persecuted, oppressed, um, alien, stranger, they know the name of the God of Jacob, and it protects them in the sense that They're confident in God. They have a a, a surety and a certainty about the Lord. Here's the third petition in verse 3. May he send you help from the sanctuary. The reference to the sanctuary is a reference to the holy place, the temple. And then it continues, and give you support from Zion. Zion is the place where the temple would be built And and so the idea is that God is uniquely present there in his temple. And David is envisioning his descendant being helped by the God who is present with his people. Verse 3 assumes that the descendant of David is going to be pious. He's going to be righteous. He says there in verse 3, May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. So this is, a, this is assuming that the descendant of David is going to be one who does bring offerings and sacrifices to God to worship him. And that phrase there, regard with favor, if we were to, if we were to look this up in, in Hebrew, we would find that it literally says, may he regard all your burnt offerings as fat. Now, now why would... Why would David want the burnt offerings to be regarded as fat. Well, it's because the descendant of David is not bringing any skinny, malnourished, reject animals. You know what I'm saying? He's not getting the animals that he doesn't want, that the cripples, the lame, the ones that are no good. No, he's bringing his best. He's bringing the healthy, thick, strong animal to offer up as a burnt offering. And then, and then, of course, if God is going to regard the animal as fat, he is going to receive it favorably. And just as verse 4 assumes the piety of the future king, verse 5 assumes that the future king is going to have won the hearts of the people. It's the opposite, really, of Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. Proverbs 29, 2 says... When the wicked rule, the people groan. When the wicked rule, the people groan. We groan when we have a judge who issues a restraining order like the one that I've described. We groan that the leader of our country 
supports abortion any time it's possible to have, even a, a partial birth abortion. A born alive, we groan that the, the president of our co- country voted against a born alive infant protection act. That means the baby is alive. And, and the lawmakers are trying to say, okay, if you've botched the abortion and the baby comes out alive, you've got to care for that, that living human being. And the president says, no, no. He votes against that four times. That is wicked. That's wicked. We groan when we have rulers like that. That's not the kind of ruler King Jesus is going to be. When King Jesus rules, Psalm 20, verse 5, may we shout for joy over your salvation. He succeeds. People aren't going to be groaning. Here it goes. No, they're going to be rejoicing. Because this is good, and this is right, and we have no reservations about this king succeeding. We're going to shout for joy over your salvation. And then, in the name of our gods, set up our banners. We're going to have these flags, and emblazoned on those flags is the name of God. And those things are going to be waving in triumph, because King Jesus has finally, at long last, conquered and set all things right. And then the last one, the last statement, the tenth blessing. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. This is a statement that assumes that everything that comes out of the heart of this king is going to be righteous. Everything that comes out of the heart of this king as a request to God is going to be something that God is going to want to do. And so David says, may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. This king is not going to be praying for anything wicked He's going to be looking for everything right. So there are the blessings. There are the ten blessings, the ten prayers that David offers up for the future king. And now in verses 6 through 8, David articulates his certainty that the Lord is going to save his anointed. Verse 6, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. What David is saying is, they may persecute him. They're not going to succeed. They may crucify him. They're not going to be able to keep him dead. The Lord saves his anointed. He will answer, verse 6, from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. God is going to reach out his strong right hand and act on behalf of the future king. And then verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Uh, that what this statement literally says, when, it, when, it, when they render it, we trust in the name of the Lord our God, if we were to render this literally, what we would have is we cause the name of Yahweh, the Lord our God, we cause the name of the Lord our God to be Remembered. We cause the name of the Lord our God to be remembered. Now, we're in Kentucky, but I grew up an Indiana University basketball fan. And uh, one year, I don't remember the exact year, maybe someone here does, a guy named Keith Smart hit a last-second basket to win, it gives me chills to think about it, to win the national championship for the Indiana Hoosiers. It was awesome. The name of Keith Smart is remembered because of his triumph. What that tells us is the one who gets the credit for the victory is the one whose name you cause to be remembered. And what this statement is saying is we're not going to cause the names of the chariots or the names of the horses or the battle gear that we used to be remembered because that's not what we're looking for for victory. We're going to cause the name of Yahweh our God to be remembered. That's what kind of people David is envisioning those who are aligned with the future king to be. We're not people who look to our own ingenuity. We're not people who look to our own cleverness or our abilities. We're going to be people who cause the name of the Lord our God to be remembered. They... The other group, the wicked, they collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Do you remember Psalm 1? Psalm 1 verse 5 said, the wicked 
will not rise in the judgment. And here we're getting the opposite of that. We rise and stand upright. What for? To cause the name of the Lord our God to be remembered. To bear witness to his saving might. To his merciful goodness. That's what the people of God are going to do. And then verse 9. The, the first line of verse 9. O Lord save the king. It really summarizes the first five verses, doesn't it? The first line summarizes those blessings that David had articulated in Psalm 20, verses 1 through 5. If the Lord saves the king, he will answer him in the day of trouble. The, his, the name of the God of Jacob will protect him. Help will be sent from the sanctuary, support from Zion. All the offerings and, and sacrifices will be remembered, and, and all the heart's desire. I think I missed that one in verse 4. The heart's desire of the king and the plans, the counsel of the king will be fulfilled. And on and on we could go when the Lord saves the king. And then the second line, may he answer us when we call. In some ways, that summarizes verses 6 through 8. Because it's it's communicating a trust in the Lord. It's communicating a confident prayer that God will do this for his anointed. So there's Psalm 20, and, and um, I've already alluded to this. Psalm 22, verse 1, these are the words that the Lord Jesus prayed from the cross on his day of distress. And God the Father answered the prayers of David in Psalm 20 by raising the Lord Jesus from the dead. And the people of God... You've heard it this morning. The people of God give ringing cries in celebration of God's salvation accomplished in the Messiah just as we have sung this morning, just as David hoped we would in Psalm 20. Now, moving out of Psalm 20 into Psalm 21, there's a relationship between these two psalms because Psalm 21 is an anticipatory, that is, it's anticipating, Celebration. It's an anticipatory celebration of the answer to the prayers of Psalm 20. So it's like David says, here are my prayers in Psalm 20. And then in Psalm 21, he says, now I'm going to celebrate you answering my prayers. And, and so we ended in 20 verse 9, O Lord, save the king. Look at the way we open in 21.1. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices. Why is the king going to rejoice in the Lord's strength, because God has accomplished salvation before him, or on his behalf, by that strength. Look at the rest of the verse. And in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. 20 verse 9, O Lord, save the king. 21 1, the king exalts in your salvation. So, so the thought from, from 20, you can see the movement of thought from Psalm 20 into Psalm 21. What's going to be celebrated here? is the way that God answers the prayers that have been offered in Psalm 20. And um, um, we have a a chiasm here in Psalm 21. Um, A a chiasm, if you're you're just uh, new here this morning, uh, the, the word chiasm is built off this Greek letter chi, which is in the shape of an X. And, and so a chiasm does this X-shaped thing on one half of it, uh, or you could call it a, a ring structure. Uh, but what we're going to see in, in verses 1 and 2 is a celebration of the Lord's strength. And, and what better thing for God's people to celebrate? Th- there is nobody stronger than the God of Israel. There's nobody more capable than the God of the Bible. So, th- so verses 1 and 2 are going to celebrate God's strength. And then verses 3 through 7 are going to articulate the way that God blesses the king. So there's a continuity of thought here. We're still dealing with the future descendant, the future king. David the king is talking about the future king. And, and so God blesses the king in verses 3 through 7. And then in verses 8 through 12, what's going to be described there is the way the king conquers. Why does the king conquer? Because God blessed him in verses 3 through 7, so he's going to conquer in verses 8 through 12. And then in verse 13, we're going to come back and celebrate God's strength again. So look at, look at verse 13, be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. Look at verse 1, O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. Now, what we're going to see in Psalm 21 
is not only the answer to the prayers of Psalm 20, but also a whole bunch of stuff from elsewhere in the Bible. So, so verse 2 is already going to start giving us answers from t- Psalm 20. Look at, look at Psalm 20, verse 4. May he grant you your heart's desire. This is another thing that, that would indicate that this is going to be a righteous king. This is going to be a king whose heart is always going to desire what God would be pleased to give him. And, and, and we can look at our own heart's desires and know uh, it would be best if God often didn't grant us our heart's desires because they're wicked, they're evil. But this king, he's going to desire righteous things. And then look at 21.2. David, David says, God, you're answering my prayer from Psalm 20, verse 4. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. So David is, is looking, I think, to the future, to the king that's going to come from his line, and he's saying this is the way the Lord is going to, uh, to reward him. And now he's going to start blessing the king, or he's going to start describing the way the Lord blesses the king in verses 3 through 7. Look at verse 3. For you meet him with rich blessings. What Psalm 21.3 is talking about, you meet him with rich blessings, is the realization of what God promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. I will bless you and make your name great. And David, David knows the promises to Abraham, and it's like he's saying God is going to bring to, to fulfillment the blessing, the blessing promised to Abraham in the life of this future king. You meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. Um, Abraham was, was promised, Genesis seventeen six. kings will come from you, Abraham. So again, this is another fulfillment of Scripture. Verse 4, he asked life of you. You gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. Uh, this, is, this is stemming from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13. Where the Lord promised to David, he said, I'm, I'm going to raise up one of your descendants and I'm going to establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And, and David is envisioning that, that promised descendant being raised up and saying, you promised life, give me life. And God's, God's granting what's asked. This phrase, length of days, is also reminiscent of Deuteronomy chapter 6. That passage where uh, Israel is called to love the Lord, their God, with all their hearts. That passage where fathers are instructed to teach the scriptures to their children. And one of the rewards in that passage is long life in the land. Same thing in Deuteronomy 17, where, where the king is instructed to copy out the scriptures and then keep it with him all his life and read it so that his heart may not be lifted up as, above his brother's so that he may continue long in the land. So this length of days forever and ever is is realizing these statements from Scripture, from earlier Scripture, and and it's it's fulfilling the indications that the king from David's line is going to reign forever. And then verse 5, His glory is great through your salvation. Now, Let's puzzle this out a little bit here. His glory, the king's glory, is great through your salvation. How does this work? Well, let's think about the fulfillment of it. His glory, Jesus' glory, is great through God's salvation. What's the, what's the ultimate realization so far of God's salvation of Jesus? Well, I think the resurrection of the dead. His glory is great. We could say the glory of Jesus is great because God raised him from the dead. Is there anything that gives Jesus greater glory than that? I can't think of anything. His glory is great through your salvation. And then we're looking forward to a return of Christ. And his glory is going to be great when God works salvation through Jesus. And he subdues all his enemies. And he establishes his throne and his realm over all the earth. His glory is great through your salvation. The next line there in verse 5. Splendor. And majesty you bestow on him. This ought to sound familiar from Psalm 8. 
Um, you, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And the language that's used here in Psalm 21 is also used there in, in Psalm 8. The, the splendor and majesty spoken of there in Psalm 8 is bestowed upon the future king here in Psalm 21, verse 5. Then verse 6, the ESV renders this, For you make him most blessed forever. And I think, again, it's an articulation of, of the, the realization of the blessing of Abraham. The next line there, You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Now, you just, you just turn on your awareness of the scriptures, your awareness of the Psalms in particular, and what do you think of when you read a line like this? You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Where do you know this from the Psalms? Psalm 1611. That's exactly right. This is ex- what David himself experienced when he said in Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David is saying, that's what the future king is going to live in. The ultimate realization of that joy in God's presence was known by Adam in the Garden of Eden. And and so I submit to you that this is indicating that this king is going to enjoy the presence of God as though he has reopened the gates to Eden and made it so that God can once again walk in the garden in the cool of the day among his, his unstained people. Verse 7, For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High he shall not be moved. Back in Psalm 18, look at Psalm 18, verse 50. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his seed forever. The same things talked about there in Psalm 1850 are in view here in Psalm 21, 7. The steadfast love of the Most High is going to be ongoing, and the king will never be moved. The descendant of David, the seed of David, will never be moved. So this is the way that God is going to bless the king, and then in the power of that blessing, the king is going to conquer his enemies in verses 8 through 12. So David has been talking about the king in the third person, right? He will do this, and you will do this for him. And now he's going to start addressing the king in the second person. And if, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus, you're getting fair warning right here. If Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So if you're not a believer in Jesus, he regards you as being against him. He regards you as rejecting his rightful authority over your life. And he regards you as being in rebellion against him. You are an enemy of the Lord Jesus if you are not gladly accepting his rule and submitting to his reign. And the psalmist, David, is saying this to the future king, who is Jesus. Your hand will find out all your enemies, which is to say none of them are going to escape. So if you're an enemy of Jesus this morning, you're getting warning right here that you're not going to get away. You are not going to find some place where you can enjoy sinful pleasures and have wicked delights in rebellion against King Jesus forever. His hand is going to find out all his enemies. And the verse continues, your right hand will find out those who hate you. You may think that you're sort of neutral toward Jesus, but if you're not accepting his authority, if you're not joining him in calling what he calls sin, sin, what you're doing is you're loving things that he hates. And, and then when he starts moving to take away things that he hates from your life, you get mad. And, and you don't like it when he says to him, you can't do that. So, so you may think you're neutrally disposed to Jesus, but actually, if you're rebelling against his authority, you, you hate him. You hate him, and you hate what he, what he says you're not supposed to do. You hate that about him. His right hand is going to find you out. The only hope for you is for you to turn and plead for mercy from this king, to turn from your sin and 
and to fall before him and say, I'm guilty before you, and my only hope is for you to forgive me, and I'm asking you to do that. Look at what he's going to do to his enemies in verse 9. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. That, that last phrase there, when you appear, literally says, in the time of your face. When he shows up face to face, his enemies are going to be made into a conflagration, a blazing fire. They're going to be lit up by Jesus. And then it says there in verse 9, the Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. The Bible, both Old and New Testaments, indicate that God destroyed the earth once by means of water at the flood, and he's going to do it a second time by means of fire. You see this in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter talks about the earth, the world that then existed, existed that was deluged with water. And then he talks about how the earth that now exists is being stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Jesus is going to consume his enemies in a blazing fire. And if you don't turn from your sin and trust completely in him, that's your fate. And it's, you may not think this way, but it's loving for us to tell you that. Because what it says is, you have an opportunity now. You have a chance now to turn from your sin, to trust in Christ, to be delivered from that fate. Verse 10, he continues, you will destroy their descendants from the earth. You know, um, the text here says, literally, you will destroy their fruit. You will destroy their fruit. So the wicked are not going to be like the blessed man in Psalm 1. You know, his fruit does not wither. His leaf does not wither. The wicked, their fruit is going to be destroyed. And then verse 10, their offspring You will destroy their offspring from among the children of man. Their seed. The reason their seed are going to be destroyed is because these people who are in rebellion against the Lord Jesus, they are seed of the serpent. They have aligned themselves with Satan, and they will be destroyed. Why? Why would God do this? The answer is in verse 11. They plan evil against you. Now puzzle this out with me for a second. What does it mean to plan evil against the Lord. It means that you're trying to get away with your stuff. You're trying to make yourself king. And, and in certain cases, it means that what you want is you want people to call God wicked and evil so that you can be exonerated as righteous. And all you have to do is read the newspaper to see that happening. Those people that object to all this abortion, those people that object to... to any kind of sexual immorality, hetero or homosexual, those are the wicked people. And the good people are the ones saying, kill them. Have at it. Commit all the immorality you want. That's exactly what's being described here. They plan evil against you. They devise mischief. But then there's comfort in the last line of verse 11. They will not succeed. They will not prevail. Why? Verse 12, for you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Now I want to give you another, another literal translation here for the first line of verse 12. Literally the text says, you appoint them a shoulder. And then it goes on to say, you will aim at their faces with their bows, with your bows. Now the ESV takes this You appoint them a shoulder as though the enemies are turning their shoulders and they're fleeing from the Lord Jesus or from the coming king. But it could be when he says you appoint them a shoulder and you aim at their faces with your bows, it could be depicting the coming king as a mighty warrior who is taking up his stance and he's appointing a shoulder at them and he's drawing that bow back and the arrow is right at their face. And nobody's going to think it's too harsh. Nobody's going to think it's unjust. Everybody's going to see this is exactly what they deserved. Because of the way that they moved those little arms and legs and hands around in the Petri dishes. And then they said it was legal. They're going to get exactly what they deserve. And the only hope for them is repentance. The only hope is for them to agree with Jesus. That's wrong. That's evil. And I've got to turn from it. And our only hope is repentance. 
our only hope for the sins that we're harboring in our hearts, whether they're grudges or points of greed in our life or lust or pride, our only hope is to turn. Because the divine warrior is going to appoint a shoulder and he's going to aim arrows. And there's going to be nobody saying, whoa, 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 whoa. This is too much, don't you think? No. What the righteous are going to be saying is in verse 13. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. What what the righteous are going to be saying is that the, the judgment is just. The criminals are guilty. The crimes have been conclusively proven beyond doubt. And the sentence is right. And they're going to be singing and praising God's power. When when the Lord establishes justice, the people of God are going to cheer him on with words like these that David has penned here in Psalm 21, verse 13. I think that, I've already indicated, I think that all of this is looking forward to Jesus. Jesus, who will be the agent of God's wrath. Jesus, who will be blessed of the Lord like no one else. Jesus, who is going to rejoice in the strength that God has given to him, who is going to conquer all his enemies, and who is going to bring about this This song of praise, into verse 13, we will sing and praise your power. We are going to psalm the epic story of the consummation of history. The happy ending of this worldwide drama. When Jesus comes, it will bring about the most satisfying resolution to the greatest story the world has ever seen. And we, God's people, will celebrate it together. Let's pray. Father, give us hearts that join with David in blessing our king. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort us with with words like this. Cause us to be those who don't trust in chariots or horses, but who cause your name to be remembered. Cause us to be those who will sing and praise your power when you establish salvation. God, we pray that you would make us faithful between now and then. We pray that you would give us eyes to see how we can be at work and hearts that are ready for the labor. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in the way that we patiently endure the great day when the Lord Jesus will come and set all things right. We ask it in his name. Amen.